the Bible is, as R.C. Sproul put it, the final authority in all controversies of faith and life. The final authority in all controversies of faith and life. If you've accepted and digested that idea, you'll have an urge to root all of your beliefs and your ideas about morality in Scripture. And what a blessed thing that is. What a protection against a world full of voices that set themselves up as moral and religious authorities that they say you must listen to. What a delight to know that the Bible, the Scripture, is your sole ultimate authority. For all matters of faith and practice. So when somebody comes along and says to you, you need to be baptized and uh, baptized in the Spirit and speak with tongues. And because you aren't baptized in the Spirit and speak with tongues, that's why you have so many problems in your life. When somebody comes along and says something like that, you can know that the multitude of issues that that statement brings up uh, can be dealt with by going to the Scripture. What does the Scripture say? What does the, the Scripture say about that? What is baptism in the Spirit anyway? And and is speaking with tongues always a result of being baptized in the Spirit? And <clears throat> is it true that if I am baptized in the Spirit as this person says and speak with tongues as this person defines it, that therefore I won't have any problems in my life? Do you see how many issues that that's, that one single statement raises? A person who believes in sola scriptura, when they're presented with thorny issues that raise all sorts of other issues, um, a person who believes in sola scriptura can just go to the Bible and take, he, he takes comfort in the fact that the Bible is there and that it is a sufficient guide. Somebody comes along and says, there must be incense in worship. A person who believes in sola scriptura, scriptura can say, well, show me that in the Bible. <clears throat> When somebody comes along and says, we should encourage others to do what they think is right, even if what they do is contrary to Scripture. Now, there's an idea that has a lot of prevalence today in many Christian circles. We should encourage others to do what they think is right, even if what they want to do is against the Bible. And somebody who believes in sola scriptura says, what does the Bible say about this? Let the Bible speak. Because it's our sole final authority in all matters of faith and practice. Or somebody says, music is amoral. You can't take a music style and tie it to morality. Somebody who says that. What does the Bible say about music? Or if somebody comes along and says this, there is one race or ethnicity that is worse than other races. That is something that's being said right now in American culture. And it has been said many times throughout the 20th century about various races or ethnicities. It's probably a better word. Well, if somebody comes along and says one race is worse than all the other races, a person who says, a person who believes in sola scriptura is going to say, what does the Bible say about ethnicity? And it is utterly beautiful when you read statements, for example, from the Apostle Paul, where he says that Jew and Gentile both are alike, are sinful, and they need to be reconciled to God through Christ, uh, and that there is no difference between ethnicities. And, you know, if somebody comes along and says, um, a fetus in the womb is just a mass of tissue, Somebody who believes in sola scriptura is going to say, well, what does the Bible say about this? What does the Bible say? Show, you know, show me, prove to me that's true, because I'm going to look at the Bible and find out what the Bible says, because it is my sole final authority in all matters of faith, that is what we believe, and practice, that is what we do. If somebody says, in the Lord's Supper, the bread becomes the literal body of Christ when it's ingested, what does the Bible say about the Lord's Supper? See, there's hardly anything more important than the doctrine of sola scriptura, scripture alone. And yet, 
this doctrine is very easily misunderstood. What I'd like to do today is we'll take a look at what sola scriptura is, and then we'll look at where it's taught in the Bible and why it matters. And then in a future sermon, we'll look at how this doctrine of sola scriptura has often been misunderstood, and it has been misunderstood often. Just in the past few decades, there's been some pushback from evangelical sources, that is, people who are believers, about what sola scriptura means. So what I want to do, and there's hardly anything more vital than this doctrine, because it is this doctrine, it is this belief in the scripture that enables you, that allows you to resolve controversies and disputes about what is right and what is wrong with authority, something other than human opinion. Is that not a blessing to know that that's what the scripture is? That's what sola scripture is essentially teaching us. So what I want to do in this day and age when there are so many ideas being batted around, so many voices out there saying, this is what's right and you must listen and this is how it, how it is and this is the narrative that I want to present that everybody must bow down to. Okay, in, a, in an environment like that, we need, we must reassert sola scriptura. Scripture alone is my final authority as to matters of what I believe and what I do. So when somebody comes along and establishes themselves as some kind of authority to say any of these things that I mentioned or any other thing, to try to assert that as though that were absolute for you, you must have recourse to Scripture. Praise God, you have it in your hands. What is sola scriptura? Let's take a look at what it is, and then we'll, taught, we'll look at where it's taught in the Bible. I'll give you some passages that teach it, and then we'll talk about why it matters. We've already talked a little bit about why it matters, um, and I think we can see it, especially in our day. We've got to hold on to this. We've got to know it. We've got to understand it and be able to explain it to others. <clears throat> So what is sola scriptura? What I want to do really quickly is look back, look at, the church, at church history and see what great Reformed Bible teachers have said about this. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a look at three modern conservative Reformed uh, theologians, and then I'm going to look back at history. Find a, I'm going to look at a Princetonian named A.A. A. Hodge, who was a great theologian, and then go back even further to the Reformation and look at what Martin Luther said about Sola Scriptura. So I'm going to give you five definitions of Sola Scriptura from trusted Bible teachers um, of, of today and of the past. And then we'll look at what the Scripture says. So let me give you these really quickly. And the whole point of me giving you these Bible teachers is not to say that these Bible teachers are as authoritative as Scripture. I simply want you to see that what I'm teaching you is commonly accepted biblical teaching so that you can understand that what you're hearing from me is not something that I dreamed up. So here we go. Let's take a look at what John Frame said about this doctrine of sola scriptura. John Frame is one of the preeminent um, philosopher theologians of our time. He said that sola scriptura is this, that scripture and only scripture, there's the sola, scripture and only scripture has the final word on everything, all our faith, all our doctrine, and all our life. Only Scripture has the final word on everything, all our doctrine, and all our life. That's a wonderful, it's probably my favorite definition of sola scriptura. Uh, here's Kevin Van Hooser. He said, sola scriptura asserts the Bible's right of final say-so as concerns all matters of truth and right, faith, and practice, thought, and life. That's a good definition. R.C. Sproul that I mentioned earlier, Sola Scriptura acknowledges that the final authority in all matters of theology and in all controversies of faith and life is not the decrees or the traditions of the church. It is sacred scripture itself. Now let's hear what A.A. A. A. Hodge had to say. He was a Princeton theologian from the 1800s. He said, The scriptures of the Old and the New Testaments, having been given by inspiration of God, are the all-sufficient and only rule of faith and practice and judge of controversies. And then, Martin Luther. 
Martin Luther in 1533, teaching in the church at Wittenberg on 1 Corinthians 15, said these words. Quote, I love these. Just listen to these powerful words. If I'm to stand my ground, I must constantly adhere to Scripture. These articles of faith which we preach are not based on human reason, and they're not based on human understanding, but they're based on Scripture. It follows that they must not be sought anywhere but in Scripture, and they must not be explained otherwise than with Scripture. You can see the emphasis there. Scripture alone for the source of truth. Scripture alone even for the explanation of truth. It's powerful. Now, if you consider those above definitions that I just gave you, uh, you might find, I, I found frames to be the most helpful and succinct. He says, Scripture alone has the final word on everything, all our doctrine and all our life. And that is an excellent summary definition of what sola scriptura is. The Bible alone is the final authority on all our doctrine, everything we believe and everything we do. It's the final ultimate authority and it's the only final and ultimate authority. Now, so there is a, I mean, if you want to know what, what do people mean when they talk about this, this is it. This is what they mean. Now, the next question, of course, is, well, what does the Bible say about this? Okay, and that is a very sola scriptura um, question, right? Only somebody who believes in sola scriptura is going to ask, what does the Bible say about sola scriptura? What does scripture say about it? Okay, um, and at this point, things get a little bit circular. But anytime you argue for your presupposition, anytime you argue, argue for your ultimate authority, you have to use your ultimate authority to argue for it because it's your ultimate authority. So, we go to the scripture to find out what it says about itself. So, let's take a look at five passages here really quickly. 2 Timothy 3, verses 16 and 17, and we'll go ahead and turn there. This is the probably the classic text on the Bible, in the Bible. 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. It says, All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, fully equipped for every good work. What a great passage. What a great verse. It basically teaches us that the Bible is from God and that it's sufficient. It is sufficient and it's fully authoritative. The Bible comes from God and it equips us for every good work. No mere human authority could ever say that. Scripture comes from God and is authoritative above any authority of man. It is supremely authoritative. And it's also supremely relevant and it's sufficient to equip us for every good work. You can see that um, this is a remarkable statement about Scripture. In other words, the Bible provides the bankable information that's necessary for godly living. 2 Timothy 3, 16 to 17. Now, one of my favorites that teaches sola scriptura is Acts 17, 11. And I think this one, this one may be the most helpful one out of all of the, of the five. They're all very important, but this one may be the most helpful one, and you'll see why. Turn over to Acts 17, 11. What you're basically getting here is a, a handful of really handy proof texts uh, interpreted in context that you can use if you ever have to explain this to somebody. I mean, you may be talking to somebody and giving the gospel and they say, why are you always talking about the Bible? What's so important about the Bible? You act as though it were some kind of authority. Well, it'd be helpful to have these passages, wouldn't it? So Acts chapter 17, verse 11. Now in this passage, um, Paul has Paul was just in Thessalonica, and he's had to go to Berea because of persecution that he was in. He was, you know, Paul was going around planting churches all over the place, fulfilling the Great Commission, because it's by church planting that the Great Commission is fulfilled. Um, that's how it goes forward. And he was busily doing that, as he did his entire life. And um, he had to flee Thessalonica because of persecution there, and he went to Berea. And when he got to Berea, he taught the people there, just like he did back in Thessalonica. But the book of Acts in chapter 17, verse 11, gives us, uh, I think, a very interesting 
insight into the hearts of the people in Berea. Let me read this to you. It says, These Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. Okay, so, whoa, that's quite a commendation of the Jews there that Paul was teaching in Berea. Well, what was so great about them? The verse goes on. It says, They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. They were examining the scriptures daily to see if what Paul was teaching them was actually the case. That is huge. Because it tells you that even if an apostle comes and starts teaching you, the Bible, the Bible is your reference point for determining whether or not you're, you're hearing the truth or not. In other words, the, even the teaching of an apostle needs to be checked up on by the Bible. And when, when you have that attitude, you're noble, it says. You're more noble because you give the Bible its due. That is an utterly astounding statement in the book of Acts right there. Scripture is clearly a reference point. It is clearly what any and every mere human teacher must conform to. It's our ultimate and final authority. Even the teaching of an apostle must accord with Scripture. Uh, a good summary statement of this doctrine is found in Isaiah chapter 8, verse 20. And I'm just going to quote this for you because I got it memorized. But it's a great way to summarize the doctrine. In fact, if you wanted a statement in Scripture that most easily or most quickly sums up the idea, it'd probably be this verse in Isaiah 8, verse 20. Um, the context there is that uh, Israel had fallen into all sorts of ungodly practices, and they were even going to sorcerers and wizards to, uh, to try to discern the future, sort of like Saul when he went to the witch of Endor. You remember that story in the book of Samuel? Well, Israel had fallen into this. And um, Isaiah basically was preaching to them that they ought to go to the Bible to find out um, the truth. And he says this statement. He says, to the law and to the testimony. If teachers, that is Bible teachers or prophets, if they don't speak according to this word, then there's no light in them. What a wonderful statement. To the law and to the testimony. If they speak not according to this word, there is no light in them. You see, the Bible, the scripture, the law, the testimony, it is highly, highly exalted. It is authoritative. It is the only final authority for faith and practice. It's a wonderful summary statement of the doctrine. To the law and to the testimony. Another scripture that I think is very helpful is in 1 Corinthians chapter 4. And I'll go ahead and have us turn to that one if you have your Bible. I hope you have your Bible there. But uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Um, here is a very short little statement from the Apostle Paul that I think is actually quite helpful. Um, it says here that Paul says in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 4, he's been talking about how... Um, that he and other Bible teachers are for their benefit. He says, all things are yours, whether Paul or Apollos or Peter. Uh, so don't exalt teachers. Um, you know, you don't want to, you don't want to try to, you, you don't want to try to say, well, Peter, he's the real Bible teacher and you don't want to listen to Paul. No, no, no. They're all gifts to the church and that they, they need to be received as gifts um, from God. And um, so he's explained that to them. And he says in verse 6, I have applied all these things. He, you know, along the way, he used, uh, he used uh, illustrations like, we are God's farmers and you're God's field. Uh, we're the builders and you're the building. We're building up. You know, the teachers are the builders and the, the people are being built up in the Lord. Um, so he's applied these illustrations to the matter at hand. And then he says, I've applied all these things to myself and Apollos for your benefit. I want you to understand, he's saying. And then he says, brothers, I want you to learn not to go beyond or above, or yeah, beyond is probably a really good way to translate that, not to go beyond what is written. Not to go beyond what is written. 
that none of you may be puffed up in favor of one against another. And that is, a, I think, a very helpful phrase. Don't go beyond what's written. Uh, the scripture is the reference point. So don't step, don't transgress its boundaries. Don't go beyond what's written. To glorify men would be definitely to go beyond what's written, Paul's saying. So don't do that. R respect the Bible's boundaries. Respect its limitations. Respect where it puts you. Respect where it draws lines in the sand. And don't step over those. That, again, assumes that the Bible is uh, the final authority. And then finally, in Psalm 119, 128, I absolutely love this verse. It's our very first verse in the Armory for Victory Memory Program. It says, I esteem all thy precepts. This is a prayer to God. Listen to this wonderful verse. I esteem all thy precepts concerning all things to be right, and I hate every false way. See, that statement right there is an explanation of the Bible as a reference point. The, the psalmist is saying to God, Oh, Lord, your word, I esteem it. I esteem all your precepts, everything you've said. I esteem all of it um, concerning all things. Whatever you've said about anything, I esteem it to be right. And I hate every false way. So not only do you esteem it to be right, but you also um, consider what it says to be wrong, something to be rejected. You see. That is a wonderful statement of the Bible as a reference point. The Bible determines what is right and what is wrong. So let me ask you, do you esteem all God's precepts concerning all things to be right? And do you hate every false way? God expects us to. So accepting sola scriptura has dramatic results in a person's life life. So we've talked about what exactly this doctrine is. You remember what it is? Remember how Frame put it? John Frame put it? He said, um, Scripture and only Scripture has the final word on everything, all our doctrine and all our life. Yes, Scripture, our final authority, our ultimate authority, right? And then we looked at the passages. I think probably the most helpful passage that sums it up would be Acts 17.11, where even the word of an apostle must agree with Scripture. And those Bereans were said to be noble because they checked up, checked up on what Paul taught and they compared it with the Bible to see if this is indeed what was true. See, that puts the Bible in a certain category. Let me put it a very, in a historical way. The church does not give authority to the Bible. The Bible gives authority to to the church. That is an utterly crucial idea. So you can see that uh, we've, we've looked at what theologians, trusted voices have said about this doctrine, and then we've looked at it and we've seen it in the scriptures. We've seen that this is indeed what the Bible itself says about itself. And now what I want to do is I want to look at three points about what this does when you accept it. There's certain... Uh, certain effect that this has on the soul. And I think we talked about this at the beginning, and let me just kind of bring this back up again. One thing I think that it's important, the, the title of this message is Sola Scriptura and Current Events. When there are people up in arms and they're throwing ideas around, batting, batting them back and forth, and just, you know, a, a lot of, just a slew of thoughts are being bandied about, and people are denouncing other people and pointing fingers, and there's, there's a lot of... Um, just differing opinion about things, and people are sorting through things. I think it's important to remember that you have a reference point to return to. You have the Scripture, which is a never-failing source of truth to be able to resolve controversies. So just recognizing that, I think, is immensely comforting because you may feel confused. Well, go to the Bible. There have been many times where somebody has challenged my thinking on something, um, and I will just, uh, you know, I'll go, well, you know, I haven't fully thought through this. I'm going to go study the scripture about it. And I go study the scripture and, and over time, sometimes it takes a little bit of time, but I find that it gives me guidance. That's the remarkable thing about the Bible. Even when it doesn't speak explicitly about an issue, it always gives principles that apply to that issue. And so it always does. It, it really is true that it thoroughly equips us for every good work. It's a beautiful thing.
Let me give you three points on this. Sola Scriptura has dramatic results in a person's life when they really grasp it and accept it. Number one, it promotes humility in you. It discourages human wisdom and pride from influencing the church. It is a humbling of one's own understanding to the Word of God. It says, let the Bible speak. It humbly insists that, Christ's, that Christ is the one who should guide his church. There's all these voices who are talking, all these people who are talking and wanting to influence the church. And somebody who believes in Sola Scriptura says, let Christ guide his sheep. Oh, how, how we must be careful not, how we must be careful not to assert ourselves as though we were shepherds. Even pastors are only under shepherds. Christ is the shepherd. He ought to guide his sheep. He himself said, my sheep hear my voice. And so it, is a, it promotes humility among people when a person really accepts this. Let Christ guide us. And it, it humbly insists on that. Let Christ guide his church, and thus it protects the church from corrupting influences. Man's fallen mind is always coming up with some new hot thing. And somebody who believes in sola scriptura says, what does the Bible say? I want to follow what the scripture teaches. In other words, it's kind of a practical way to put Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 in, into practice. Uh, you remember Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, one of the most famous verses in the Old Testament. It says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your paths or he will make your paths straight. See, that's a remarkable statement. Don't lean on your own understanding. How do you do that? Well, you need to learn on, lean on God's knowledge, not your own understanding. And so it promotes humility and it lets, it insists, humbly insists that Christ Guides his church. Notice, not cantankerously insists that Christ guide his church, but humbly insists that Christ guide his church. And it's a practical way to put the most common verses into use. Lean not on your understanding. Well, whose understanding am I going to lean on? God's. God's. If you're beleaguered by all these voices telling you what Christianity ought to be and what pastors ought to be and what churches ought to be doing and what we ought to be believing and, and you're just beleaguered by all that, what saith the scripture? What does the Bible say? Let the Bible speak. So number one, it promotes humility in Christian circles, Christian heart, and Christian circles, and Christian churches, and in the culture at large. And you'll know, you know when sola scriptura is being moved to the side. You know when it's being set aside, when there's all these voices and nobody is saying, what does the Bible say about these matters? They're just listening to people. So it promotes humility. Secondly, it promotes an avid dependence on and use of Scripture. Psalm 1, verses 1 through 3, um, talks about Christians needing to meditate in the law of the Lord day and night. And Joshua chapter 1, verse 8 says, This book of the law shall not depart out of your mouth, but you shall meditate therein day and night, that you may be careful to do all that is written in it. See, that is an avid dependence on and recourse to Scripture. You're meditating on it all the time. You're not assuming, oh, I got that down. Yeah, I've heard that. I've heard a million sermons. You know, I, I don't need to hear any more Scripture. I, I know the Bible. No, no, no person who understands his own heart knows he's never going to get to the bottom of that book and he always is going to be have a tendency to forget the things he really needs to remember and so he's always going to be going back. He's going to be remembering to remember as I heard somebody say it once. And they'll never say, oh, we don't need scripture to figure this out. We got our common sense. See, that's somebody who does not understand sola scriptura. Somebody who says, we don't need scripture to figure these things out. We got our common sense. They don't understand the fallen heart of man and they don't understand sola scriptura. The Bible alone is our soul, or the Bible alone is our final authority in matters of faith and practice. 
And these sorts of statements, statements like we don't need scripture to figure this out, those sorts of statements reek of human-centered autonomy. Now remember, what's a good way to summarize sola scriptura? To the law and to the testimony. I think that those who have accepted this doctrine, this precious doctrine, and, and it, those who have really worked it down into their soul and who understand the pride of man, people like that can sense autonomous thinking. They can feel it. It's like a breeze. They can feel it in the air. They realize, they can just tell when there's thinking going on that is unmoored and disconnected from the Bible. And they are zealous. They have an urge to root faith and practice in Scripture. They're zealous to not just let the Bible be, be you know, one, in one seat around the table, but it should be enthroned at the head of the table. So number one, when you accept sola scriptura, it promotes humility. Number two, it promotes an avid dependence on and recourse to scripture. Avid. That is so important. Remember, meditate on it day and night that you may be sure to do all that is written therein. And then thirdly, it promotes a biblically oriented pulpit ministry. When pastors get this into their heads and when it breathes and lives in their souls, when they get into the pulpit, good things come out of them because they are digesting scripture all the time. They're humble and they don't want to promote anything but what the Bible says. And they want Christ to guide his sheep. And so they're avidly seeking the Bible. And whenever they get free time, they go to it and they refresh themselves in it. and They immerse themselves in it. They steep their souls in it. And then when it's filling them, they go give it to others from a hot heart and a fully charged mind. It's a beautiful thing when this happens. When a teacher, when a teacher takes it upon himself to instruct Christ's sheep, then he better have Christ's word. He must do it with Christ's word. Would we dare direct his sheep with anything else? Would you use your word instead of his word to be taught? In the Old Testament, when God rebuked the false prophets, and there are some very choice rebukes from God for the false prophets in the Old Testament, he described them this way. God describes these prophets, the false prophets, this way. He says, quote, this is from Jeremiah 23, verse 16. He says, They speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord a vision of their own heart. You can see that there's a lot about sola scriptura in the Bible. You know, a, you know a false prophet because he's always just saying what he thinks. He's not going to the scripture and giving what the scripture says. Therefore, if we accept sola scriptura, if we accept it, it will humble us. It will... Help us to humbly insist on Christ leading his sheep. It will promote an avid dependence upon Scripture and the explicit statements of the Bible. We'll be going to ransack the Bible for answers and for reminders and to, to confirm what we know. And it will promote a wonderfully biblical pulpit ministry that will be a never-ceasing source of blessing to those who hear it and who humble themselves to hear it. And therefore, if we accept this doctrine, and we should, it's precious, when we accept it, it will lead us through the difficult days to come when many voices tell us, you should think this, and you should do this, and you're bad because you haven't already thought through this. And when people come along, and they want you to bow thoughtlessly, one of the greatest curses of our age is a tendency to rash judgments, jumping to conclusions based on little analysis and heightened emotions. And the biblical Christian in such a setting says, 
I'm open to be rebuked by any scripture and sound reason. I will, I will alter my ways if anybody speaks to me, if I've been wrong, that you've got to show me from the Bible. There's a wonderful song that we sing in Christian circles, and one of the statements in it, in it, in it is, to you, Lord, to you alone, may my spirit yield. As the deer pants for the water, right? Remember that song? One of the phrases in one of the stanzas is, Lord, to you alone may my spirit yield. We've sung that a thousand times. It's true. To the Lord alone may our, may our spirit yield. There's so many thoughts out there. You just hold on to what he's told you. If we accept this doctrine, it will lead us through the difficult days to come. We will recognize that Christ has left us his word to guide us when so many other voices are clamoring for us to follow them. Remember, my sheep, Jesus said, hear my voice.